In this episode, we'll be talking about what you can do to accelerate the adoption of service design. We'll talk about why we need to start thinking about service design as a way to design new business models. And finally, we'll talk about how policies, government policies can help to grow the supply and demand side of service design. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, my name is Christian Basin, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you do more work that makes you proud by designing and delivering services that are good for people and business. My guest in this episode is an author of several books on design. He holds a PhD in design leadership and is currently the CEO of the Danish Design Council. His name is Christian Basin. The main theme for this episode is how do we create the conditions for service design to grow, both on the supply side and demand side. So in terms of education, but also educating our clients. So that's what we'll be talking about. If you're interested in topics like this and would like to see more, don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we bring new videos like this at least once a week. So that's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the interview with Christian. Welcome to the show, Christian. Uh, thanks for having me. Really interesting to, to have you on the show. Uh, somebody with so much experience, so much expertise. For the people who don't know who you are, there might be a few out there. Could you give like a 30 second introduction? Yeah, so I'm the uh, CEO of the Danish Design Center, which is a government funded uh, body to advance the value of design in uh, both for business and society. Uh, before that, I led uh, MindLab, which was the Danish government's innovation team for about eight years. And before that, I was a management consultant. Uh, I've done a PhD in uh, service design and leadership, and um, I'm also the author of a number of books on the topic. Super, uh, a lot of knowledge here in this episode. So I'm, uh, I'm excited to have this conversation. Christian, this is called the Service Design Show. Um, it, and you, you wrote a few books on service design, but do you actually remember the very first time you sort of got in touch with the term? Yeah, so when I... Um I started with my interest in, in actually in, in government innovation and uh, and what drives that and and uh, the idea that uh, maybe there's such a thing as uh, starting with uh, citizens uh, rather than starting with the system or with the professionals when it comes to creating better services uh, for for people and so so um, that was sort of my, my my first introduction and I and I came across a a service design project or at least that was called that from around 2001, uh, which was run uh, up in, uh, in the UK, mm. uh, part of our government funded program there. Uh, and it was a company that I didn't know at the time, it was called uh, LiveWork, that had carried out that uh, project. That was the first case example, I think, that I came across of, of service mm. design. And from then on, um, well, when first you start looking for it, then you, you see it everywhere, right? It's a rabbit hole, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, cool. So. Because of your current role and all the background that you have, you shared a few really interesting topics. Uh, I shared some question starters with you. Are you ready to do some interview jazz? Sure, let's go. Let's go. <clears throat> Topic number one. Let drum roll. <clears throat> there it is. The scaling of service design. Do you have a question starter and can you show it to us? Yeah, I think uh, what we need to discuss is uh, this one. It's basically how far can it go? Okay. How far in which which sense? Right. So in the last uh, decade and a half, when I've been looking into into design uh, and design service design, I I've really seen um, a spreading and a scaling of the application of service design across industries, across sectors and domains, that's quite um, amazing. So, so as I mentioned, my own entry point came from the question about innovations in government and in uh, public uh, services. Um, uh, currently, the last five years, I've worked you know, uh, much more across uh, business and industry, and I'm seeing how uh, practice of service design become increasingly relevant in sectors where you may have not imagined it. I've seen it in um, 
people creating um, uh, solutions for offshore uh, drilling. I've seen it in, uh, in pharmaceutical industry where you have innovations happening around R&D and of course the, uh, the materials you put into uh, dr uh, drugs but also service design as an approach to uh, enhancing patient compliance and how do customers actually understand how to use uh, the drugs that they buy. Uh, and of course, I've seen a massive scaling of service design across uh, the public sector um, at all kinds of levels from local governments to, uh, to national governments. I've seen the blending of service design into issues around uh, nudging and behavioral insights and so on. So I think the question becomes really, how far could service design go? Uh, what's the, 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 the potential of scaling service design into new industries and sectors? And I, I don't really see where it might end. I think it's a really mm. pervasive question, right? I think one of the episodes, uh, we discussed the topic that every business is basically a service business nowadays. Um, yes. yes, exactly. So uh, if, you're, if you're running a business, if you're running a, an organization and you want to design that you're basically always doing service design, right? That's Exactly. And I think that's one of the, the great insights. And actually, you can say that, uh, that uh, physical products, you know, they, 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 if they're any good, they perform a service, right? So ultimately, it's a question of uh, value creation and the interaction between something we put into the world and then actors, people, uh, organizations using it. Uh, and so, so service design becomes a, a really, really powerful perspective. And, you know, ultimately, in, in my own work, also in my academic work, uh, I've... Uh, I've taken good advice from a lot of people and, and I actually generally talk about design. And when I talk about design, I talk about how design has this, this bandwidth in terms of everything from graphics and products to services and systems. But in many ways, I think the glue that binds it all together is really, you could call it service design because it's all about what, what, what happens in the interactions and the flows and where people move or in the world and, and they interact with, uh, with what we put in there. And, and so, so it's really a powerful perspective that's useful in all kinds of uh, areas of designing. So if the question, if we sort of go beyond how far can we scale it and we come to the conclusion that it's almost um, endless, the next question maybe becomes how can we accelerate the the scaling so or yeah. what is currently yeah. uh, maybe limiting us what is your perspective on that well a couple of things uh and i think that, that you know that's in many ways my day job is that you know the big question how, how might we scale and and accelerate the scaling of, uh, of of this practice because we know how valuable it is and we know how it's a differentiator for for business and and other organizations so how do we accelerate the pace. I think there's a, a, a lot of dimensions. You might even talk about an ecosystem, right? One of obviously is in terms of education. Like how do we educate future designers? And still, uh, at least that's the case in Denmark, service design has only been marginal in the, in the, in the traditional design schools, the art-based design schools. Service design has maybe been more uh, clear in, in, in the uh, you know, engineering schools and the technically founded, founded schools, in, uh, in, in, even in the business schools, because it's somehow it's better with the notions of value creation in business or value creations of technology. But, you know, no matter whether you look at, at the design, art-based design schools or you look at the other schools, we do need to have deeper and more, more, more uh, reflective practices, educate more students. We need to have more professors of uh, service design. We need to have a stronger research environment. So that's one part of the ecosystem. Another part of the ecosystem obviously is the awareness in, in, in the business community and the awareness in, 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 in the public sector of the power of service design. And here, uh, I mean, we, we do, we do uh, uh, surveys on this in, in, in Denmark, and we know that uh, about 40% of Danish companies have no idea what design might mean to them in any shape or form. And so, so there's a huge potential to, to bring awareness and, and, and understanding and, and then also a, a demand for design. Uh, to business, and that's that's a, a, a major major question. And part of that is also that when we say design, people do tend to think uh, about products and physical things, artifacts, yeah, yeah. artifacts, uh, graphics, and, and 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 products. And so and so, there's a job to be done in terms of expanding the notion of design into services. And as we as I said before, we we also talk a lot about you know business models and systems. Of course, they they can only be crafted and created through. I, I would say. Uh, service design or design research. So, so that's a big job. 
And then um, I, I would say, and we can maybe talk about that later, but there's a question of policy, which means what are we doing from a government side to stimulate across all of society how, um, how uh, service design could be accelerated and, and advanced. That could be around making it easier to invest. It could be around uh, funding programs and grants and so on. Mm. There's a part of that ecosystem too. We'll get into policy policies for sure. Yeah. If, if I sort of summarize you uh, your answer to this, it's like we need to work to accelerate the scaling of service design. We need to work on uh, both the supply side, like that's the yes. education, but also at, on the demand side. Like exactly. it makes sense, of course, but... Uh, it, that's that, that's how clear it is, right? We need yes. to have better service designers. We need to have people who are able to practice this. And we also need to have yeah. people who want this. And a part of the supply side, when we talk about the design community, uh, it's not only the next generation of designers, obviously. It's also a question of uh, the designers and the many designers already in the labor market uh, practicing design. How do they maybe uh, continue their professional development? How do they get access to some of the tools and approaches? Uh, because in the same way, you could say that service design and, and by extension design thinking is in a way um, uh, making more explicit some of the more implicit methodologies and approaches that traditionally trained designers have always used. So for many you know, designers who think of themselves as industrial designers, for example, service design actually is quite intuitive when they get to it. But it may be helpful to get some of the more formal methodologies and tools up, up front. And so there's maybe a, I think there really is a professional development challenge for the design community to bring service design much more front and center uh, as, as, as a more yeah, uh, core uh, practice uh, in, 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 in the field. Hmm. <clears throat> I always like to sort of uh, s describe it as the, the, the traditional design practitioners sort of need to learn a new design material. Like they've been working yep. with a with a certain design material that can be graphic design or or, or wood. I don't care. And now yes. you need to start designing with relationships, interactions, processes. Yes. And, and in that context, of course, we can't underestimate the the, the uh, role of digital uh, and mm. the role of new technologies in general. And, and so I think it's a, both a question of opening up also for new types of materials really to work with, mm. but also it's a whole shift in perspective. Again, maybe it's in, in, implicit in, in much industrial and, and graphic and visual communication, but the whole notion that we're really about designing it for interactions. And we can then use a lot of different ways and tools and so on of, of doing so. You hinted upon the second topic, so let's just move into that. <laughs> and uh, the second topic, um, <clears throat> it's called new business models. And it will make sense in a second. So hey, do you have a question starter? Yeah. Let's do this one. What if? Hmm. And the reason I say that is that and I've been writing about this, actually, one of, one of my books is called Shape the Future. It's really about this, this issue, right? That what would happen if we viewed the uh, object of designing as a new business model? So we, so we, so we sort of move the, the focus of attention from two-dimensional graphics and away from three-dimensional products and even four-dimensional, you could say, services, but into what are the systems and the models that shape value creation? Yeah. And yeah, of course... Yeah. That's not independent, of course, of service design. It's, it's actually closely interlinked. But you could say, put it this way, and I've seen this happen in, in, in so many different contexts and projects, right? That you start with end users, you start with service journey mapping, you start with insights, you start with crafting. How might you create more value for people? And then you go backwards from there and you open up your, your perspective and say, actually, this raises questions about the entire way in which we configure resources to be able to do this. And then you're in, then you're suddenly in the domain of business models, and, and, and then you scare your clients. <laughs> yes, well, well, you scare well not only your clients, but you might also scare your scare the designers. Yeah, right? that's be, true. Because that's because true. designers maybe also lack a language and uh, an educational background and and feel and maybe they don't feel comfortable uh, in that in that space. But I to me this is the big game, and you know one game is to try to design discrete minute you know service flows and and tweak and twist things here and there or even get servitization into a sort of product space but the big game that is really really interesting to ceos and decision makers in business and on the other side also in government these days is in a time of you know technological change disruption more globalization 
new types of consumer patterns and demands. It is really those questions, well, new questions about sustainability as well. It really becomes how do we configure what we do so we create more value in the interactions with our end users. And that's a service design question. But that, that means that service designers have to scale up also in terms of thinking about the implications for business. And business leaders have to understand that service design could actually be the trigger or the key to understanding how to change their business model. So I think there's a really, really powerful point here, but connecting those dots has really not necessarily happened enough yet. And that's maybe also when we say scaling, you know, maybe it's really making service design into a, a, a true practice of business model innovation. What <clears throat> I, I, I completely agree. And I, I think we, this, this is related to the conversation where designers say we need a seat at the table because we want to increase our influence. Um, yes. But what is, <clears throat> that's not happening a lot. There are a few exceptions, but it's still not happening a lot. Is that, of course, the, the both sides are, are sort of to blame here, but what mm -hmm. could we do? Because we, we only can influence ourselves as a service design community to, right. I don't know, increase our influence, be taken more seriously. Yeah. Well, there's a schism there, right? There's, a, there's some paradoxes and dilemmas. I mean, my own experience has been that quite few designers, I mean, educated, professionally trained designers have appetite for the types of conversations that take place in, in that space, the business model space, the strategy space. Um, many tend to prefer to stay in, in, in the crafting and, and in the, the shaping of beautiful both product services um, uh, graphics. And so... I think in some ways we need to build an, the next breed of designers that are more comfortable in this space. This could be both through education, but also through professional development. Um, because, you know, it's hard enough to bring design in from the business perspective and convince CEOs and decision makers why design and designers are important. But if the designers aren't really interested and have appetite for it or feel uncomfortable, or would rather actually stay in their studios and do what they think they do best, then this won't happen. So I think mm. we're talking about a type of a new breed. And honestly, that might be the potentially positive fallout from the purchasing right now from the, the big management consultancies of design agencies, the McKinsey's, the Deloitte's and so on, and of how big corporations are also purchasing and integrating uh, design teams within, within their structures, right? So mm. this could be potentially positive fallout. But Again, I, I think the jury is still out a little bit on whether this will uh, will happen, right? Whether we will see design moving into that strategic level. Yeah, the, the, if we are sort of really critical, we could ask the question, like, will the design slash service design community ever move into that space? Or uh, should we expect the business community to actually start adopting service design? Because they are interested in business models. Yes. They are interested yes. in value creation. Are we are we up for it? Like, I think the jury's out on it. I, yeah, I really do. Yeah. I, I I just think that. And from I mean, so I, my own background, right? Originally, is political science. I did my PhD in design. I, I understand both sides. I understand sort of the rational, analytical logic from the business community and government, but I also understand the 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 passion and the. Uh, uh, drive and interest and the love for design when it comes to shaping and making beautiful aesthetic experiences for people. And I think it's in that mix we need to bring things together. I think it could come from both sides. I'll just be a little bit um, wary that if it, we only get sort of, if design gets co-opted so much by strategists mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. business business model uh, gurus and, uh, and, and, and business development teams in, 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 in corporates and also in consultancies, whether we're going to lose something really, really important. I think we're going to lose the edge that design brings. We're going to lose the aesthetics. We're going to lose the sensibilities. We're going to lose the human uh, empathy and the insights into uh, all types of different aspects of the human uh, condition that is not natural and is not part of the really, you know, the curriculum nor the language of business people and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and government people. So, so I think we, we it, it's risky. And, and I would love it if we could find ways where we could bring in hybrids you could say right people who have a balanced uh, perspective who people who are coming from the design field into organizations and corporates and and find their their space uh, in, in in a good way 
And, and that's maybe the role we, we play mm. in the Danish society and also to talk with business leaders about how to create that space. Mm. Mm. It's it's maybe uh, maybe it's just my uh, tunnel vision, but it for me it comes down back again to a few things. Like we designers need to be interested in solving bigger problems, working yes. on bigger challenges, and bigger exactly. challenges include new things like new business models. And the other thing is like again, it's all about what what do you consider to be your design material, right? Because. Sure. Uh, a company, a business model, there are just bits and pieces in there that you yeah. can learn the the, the aspects True. of and, and start to to craft. It's it's it can be just as yeah. much a craft as is absolutely. working in graphic and design. So absolutely. And so mm. I agree that the designers need to be have appetite to to work on bigger problems and more complex problems, more abstract problems sometimes as well. But designers also need to be really interested in more impact, right? Because positioning yourself close to decision makers you know, that's always been where designers have had most impact. Also in industrial design, when, when the industrial designer uh, uh, was, you know, invited into the C-suite, maybe not as a director, but as a partner with the executives. And the best, you know, most design-driven companies today in the world are also companies that have, you know, top designers very, very close to decision-making. So it's a question of you, that you can have, have impact. Uh, and, and the potential for designers to make more of a difference in the world, not least when it comes to those big topics of sustainability, uh, durability, and, uh, and, and our planet's future and so on, right? So I think that's, a, that's the opportunity. Mm. And, and uh, we, need, we simply need to get, get more designers in there. And then the other point you're mentioning about what is then the role in this sort of more complex organizational setting for service designers. And here I'd say that Organizations are worlds on their own, which, which need new interactions internally between employees and management, between different divisions, between different skill sets and different silos of expertise and, and functions and so on. So there's a massive potential for service design as really that organizational um, capability to craft and change how we work in order to make a difference to customers and and, and users. So, and I don't think that many designers see themselves as being able to have that powerful role. In many ways, that might be the future of, of HR, you know, uh, that design is really needed there. And designers need to maybe be in alliance with human resource departments um, as uh, partners in sort of organizational change. That has been also, that is sort of uh, definitely a pattern I see coming up uh, based on the last 10, 20 episodes that yeah. we're we are getting into the position of shaping organizations exactly. or at least playing a part in there. And, and, and the powerful part here is the way that service designers can be in the business of shaping organizations is not by doing it for the organizations, but is by empowering people, empowering leaders, providing them with tools, processes, ways of working, which really you know, becomes a bottom-up involving and engaging process of, of, of people in organizations redesigning their own work. And that's Absolutely. really the power of service design. We're, we're creating the conditions, we're, facil we're facilitating the change, basically. Exactly, exactly. Let's move on uh, to topic number three, three because uh, it's sort of really interlinks, uh, considering facilitating change. And the third topic is politics and politics, policies, sorry, policies are a way to facilitate change. And do you have a question starter again? Yeah. Um... I think maybe this is going to be the one. Uh, how can we? Uh -huh. And by saying how can we, uh, what I mean by that is a couple of things. I mean, one, which is the role of the Danish Science Center, is how can we, at a national level, uh, uh, from, from, you could say from the political level, decide that we want to advance the practice of service design in our nation or in our region or you know in our our even in a level like the European Union for example or a level of the United Nations and the reason I'm saying that is that if we have now seen um, extremely convincing evidence that service design is key to creating more value for people and organizations and is a differentiating factor for business but also at a national level why wouldn't you then invest from even from taxpayers in stimulating, in accelerating, in scaling, in the adoption of service design more broadly in society. Now that's of course investing in education and research, but it could also be investing in programs, efforts that accelerate, you know, open up the eyes of business leaders and government leaders to what service design can do, 
And so that is, I think, where the most, you know, some leading nations around the world have been investing and are still investing and actually doing it increasingly. So, you know, the UK, Singapore, and certainly also Denmark has recognized that uh, we need to invest in, in design and increasingly in service design and bringing that into sort of a, a policy context. Uh, so, so this is uh, the question, and I think many more countries around the world, and even also international organizations, how to, how to f- they have to find out how can we, how can we develop policies that accelerate and stimulate uh, so, use of service yeah. design. Policies and design always sort of feel like uh, n- n- not things that go that blend really well, but I'm interested, well, like, what have you seen over the last years? What are some ingredients in policies that make for effective policy policies to stimulate the adoption of design? And what, what, what are maybe also some things that are, don't make effective policies? Right. So one part of it is, uh, is leadership, right? So it's, it's simply articulating that this is really, really important. Um, and last so week, we, the Danish we, go- we missed it less, less than seconds. We missed the last 10 seconds. Okay. I'm saying try so again. So the last part, so, so the most important part is leadership. Was that? Yeah. Political leadership, which yeah. means that yeah. political leaders state and communicate to the public. This is really, really important. So last week, the uh, Danish government launched a, um, a new policy on, on, on design and creative industries. And uh, four ministers went out and said, this is really, really important. Design is a differentiator for this country. We need to invest. We need to create new programs. We need to stimulate the sector and so on. So that's one example. Another example is the uh, prime minister of Singapore, who recently went out and said that Singapore as a nation cannot make the next evolutionary leap as a country without design thinking slash service design. So, so that's a really powerful thing for a prime minister to say to a nation. And, and it, 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 you know, people got to start asking themselves, hmm, what is this design thing that mm-hmm. he's talking mm-hmm. about? And, and is this important to us? And maybe we should take, be, to be curious about this. So I think that's part of it. And the other part, of course, is, is you know, the, the instruments of uh, policymaking, right? So what are the instruments one can use um, from you know, soft instruments like branding a country or branding design? communicating more, but also to um, even, you know, um, regulations around intellectual property. It could be uh, investment programs. Uh, Right now in Denmark, we are running a government funded program to bring service design to 100 uh, SMEs, Mm -hmm. small and medium sized enterprises. And it's uh, simply funded by the state uh, to uh, to it's called we call the program Sprint Digital. Uh, But it's basically uh, we are organizing it where we match design bureaus agencies together with SMEs to run very fast, intensive uh, design sprints to uh, help them uh, become more digital and more value creating. So that's another example of sort of very hands-on uh, programs that can stimulate the, uh, the the adoption and also give many more case examples of how design can make a difference. Yeah, so uh, leadership makes a lot of sense and also uh, building the, the proof because that's yeah. Right, that's the other thing that you're it's addressing. The proof, and also I think that's one very fundamental thing. And now again, this is the political scientist in, in me speaking that businesses aren't really um, that uh, happy with risk. Uh, mm. Businesses generally actually mm. want to reduce risk. And when designers come in and say, "Hey, let's explore the future. Let's uh, find all new insights. Let's uh, transform business models or re- redesign your services," it actually can sound slightly risky. And so we are finding that uh, by bringing in a little bit of government funding to de-risk, by bringing in someone like us who can say, listen, we know a lot about this. Uh, We we know what you're doing. We have other examples. We can match you with other leaders in business that have tried it before. Uh, Don't worry. By the way, we also know who are uh, among the best designers and design agencies so we can help curate Mm -hmm. a good match that can sort of de-risk the experimentation and the exploration of what could service design do for me uh, in, my, in my business. So there's a role there to sort of de-risk at the same time as we actually invite in companies to take more uh, of, of chances or to experiment more and accelerate their business development. So mm. there's a role there to play. If you, if you uh, would start, if, if, if you would become the prime minister of uh, Hungary. Oh. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I, let's say I, that. I, Hungary. <laughs> and... Uh, you could start all over and design, put some policies into place to stimulate the design community, the adoption of design in Hungary. Yeah. What would be some of the things with your experience from now you'd, you'd do? Right. So, so apart from sort of changing quite a lot of other things in Hungarian politics, uh, <laughs> which is sorely needed, 
I would um, I would I would start uh, on thinking about this ecosystem, right? So an ecosystem consisting of investments in education, uh, you know, building better design education uh, at, with the existing schools that are available, uh, building better design research. It would be business advocacy education programs, like I just mentioned, to stimulate the sort of adoption of design in business. I would definitely invest in some kind of capability like a design center or like a design promotion body, you could say, that really would exist to be sort of the executive arm there. I begin to look into what are the, the, the what's the design DNA of our nation? What's the DNA we're building on um, that, that characterizes how we in this country go about designing and how can we make that more explicit? So we, we did that in Denmark, you know, we, we sort of mapped the Danish design DNA, which we of course know is something about some beautiful aesthetics, Nord, Nordic style but has lots and lots and lots of other social and uh, collaborative and uh, human-centered layers. And making that explicit for a country, I think, is, uh, is powerful as well to, to just be able to see the forest for the trees and have a common language around what is our unique approach to design. Hmm. Those would be some of the things I would, uh, I would do. I'd have conversations with business leaders about their approaches to design. And I'd also take my, own, I'd, uh, you know, take my own medicine, as we say. I would begin to adopt design into government and service design into how the public sector creates its services and how it interacts with citizens. Because that is the, you know, the best way of learning actually to bring it up close and say, if we're preaching design to, to business, let's, let's practice it ourselves and show how, how good service design can also transform government. Hmm. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Christian, um, sort of, there's always a chance for the guests on the show to, you've answered a lot of the questions we had. But is there a question that you have for us as a design community, the listeners and the viewers of the show, anything that we can think about? Yeah, I think there's one uh, sort of overarching question that we really haven't addressed so much, but I'm really curious about. And, um, and in my sort of day job, I see so much focus on, on technology and digital, uh, including, you know, purely sort of digital service journeys and sort of that whole, whole, whole aspect. And so I'm wondering... Where do you see the future of service design as a as a as a, as a profession, right? So 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 in that sort of digital context, what what, what does a service designer in the future need to be skilled at, or what are, what are the challenges that service designers are facing? What are the challenges service designers are facing? <laughs> I think that More will questions. be a long list. <laughs> um, in, a, in a digital context, right? In a in digital, digital context, session, that's good. All right, Christian, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot because we didn't discuss this up front, but uh, I also did it with Lara and that worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, you've written a few books. Would you be interested in giving away a signed copy to one of the people who comments uh, here? Absolutely, I'd love to. I, I brought a, a couple of them uh, with me, so, so there's actually even an opportunity to, to uh, you know, take different ones. There's, there's this one and there's uh, this one. This is the one in Danish, so it has to be a Dane. Uh, there's this <laughs> Leading one, which public is, uh, design. Uh, yeah, I'm reading them out for the people name. for the podcast. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do it backwards again. So there's Leading Public Sector Innovation. Right? Uh -huh. And there's the one, and this one in Danish. Yeah. It's Form Framtiden, Leading Public Design. Yeah. And, design. and this one. These are so uh, so actually uh, the offer is you can pick it pick and choose which one and then I'll uh, be happy to sign it. Awesome. So basically the uh, the assignment is leave a comment and uh, everybody who comments within a week after this video goes public uh, makes a chance to win one win a signed autograph of one of your books. Um, yeah, Christian, thanks a lot for making the time and sharing what's on your mind uh, in this episode. Well, you're welcome. It's really a pleasure and nice, um, fun to explore these topics with you. So don't forget to leave a comment if you want to make a chance to win a signed copy of one of Christian's books. And if you want to level up your service design skills even further, check out this video that is going to help you to do that. And click that subscribe button over here to see more episodes. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing the next video.